Welcome to part three in our three-part series investigating the Sierra Nevada foothills. As the 20th century opened, both gold and granite mining began to fade. Farming and ranching became the principal industries in the Sierra Nevada foothill towns. After World War II, the once sleepy farm towns would give way to rapid urbanization. Farmland would be paved over, replaced with soccer fields, manicured urban dwellings, and strip malls. Streams, which were once rich with salmon and steelhead trout, would now channel urban runoff. Today, for the inquisitive, there are hidden surprises still to be found. Before we start, Leah, do you have any questions? I have lots of questions about our history of our area. Why do other cities have downtown, but Rockland doesn't? Really salmon here in Rockland? I thought they all died out in the 1800s because everyone ate them. This bridge looks really old. I wonder who built it. Why are there so many rocks out here? And who put them here? Why are there so many palm trees here in Rockland? And who planted them? Leah, to answer these questions, we will have to backtrack on our story back to the gold rush. In 1854, wealthy Boston businessman George Whitney arrived in San Francisco. His four sons had arrived earlier with the goal of striking it rich in the gold fields. Upon arrival, however, he found that his sons had not found their fame and fortune in the laborious task of panning for gold. Instead, their wealth would come from selling scarce merchandise to both miners and mining companies. Always on the lookout for a new entrepreneurial opportunity, George Whitney observed that the miners were willing to pay a high price for quality Australian merino wool. The Whitneys quickly developed a business plan, import sheep from Australia, and then crossbreed the sheep with domestic stock. For their new enterprise, they purchased 320 acres of land in the railroad town of Rockland. To add to their ranch, they purchased more land from the railroad, paying from 90 cents to $2 per acre. The Whitneys also enlisted would-be homesteaders. The homesteaders would receive land from the United States government, but instead of settling on the land as required by law, they would quickly resell the homestead to the Whitneys for $5 per acre. In the 1870s, Joel Parker Whitney, the youngest of the four sons took control of the ranch. The family's vast holdings would now encompass 20,000 acres. Throughout the West, his further investments in gold and silver mines created an estimated income at over $1 million per year. Because of his wealth and influence, Whitney was chosen the ambassador for the mining interests for the Colorado Territory. His travels took him to Paris and the Exposition of 1867. In the 1870s, Whitney traveled to England. It was then that he would meet his third wife, Lucy Chadwick. With his English bride at his side, Whitney would try to recreate a proper English estate on his vast Rockland Spring Valley ranch. He leveled five acres overlooking Spring Valley and began constructing his dream home. After three years of construction, the Oaks, as he would call his new home, encompassed three stories, 20 rooms, a carriage house, servant quarters, cricket field, and a golf course, a show place telling one and all of his financial success. Using Chinese laborers, Whitney tied his vast Rockland land holdings together with roads as well as 12 stone bridges. Reflecting an English style he loved, the bridges were constructed from locally quarried granite. In 1884, California declared hydraulic mining a public nuisance. Hydraulic mining had washed millions of tons of silt and toxic chemicals downstream. In the valley floors and foothills, whole watersheds had been destroyed. For the farmer, irrigation ditches filled with silt 
streams and rivers overflowed their banks. With the end of hydraulic mining, however, streams and irrigation canals once again ran clean and free. A new phase in agricultural development was now possible. J.P. Whitney saw a new entrepreneurial opportunity. Cleaner and more plentiful irrigation water permitted expansion of farmland. Utilizing Chinese laborers, Whitney began constructing irrigation canals. His goal was to bring water down from the Bear River to Penryn, Loomis, and Rockland. He then joined with other local landowners. Whitney's new project would subdivide 6,000 acres of land into 50 orange groves. The groves would then be sold to English noblemen. He coined the subdivision English Colony. Whitney had experimented planting citrus trees on terraced hillsides. The trees he found benefited from the warm, uplifted air currents. You can peek into the past by visiting Rock Hill Winery on Del Mar Avenue, just off Sierra College Road. By stepping behind the winery, you can still see remnants of the terraces. During the 19th century, laborers piled field stones to help designate property lines to add class to citrus colony and to delineate property lines whitney planted 1000 palm trees just across from rock hill winery the stately palms still grace delmar avenue to further gentrify citrus colony a gentleman's lodge was secured what better place to begin your fox hunt that is much to the chagrin of local residents whose gardens and fences were destroyed. Today, the lodge is a private residence. On Sundays, a proper English family required an Episcopal church to attend. To be sure, one was constructed. Whitney must have thought he had created the perfect business plan. What could go wrong? Reality, however, soon set in. In 1893, an economic panic struck the United States. In 1899, a malaria outbreak struck the development. It seems the new irrigation canals had brought in an influx of mosquitoes. In one year, an early freeze destroyed the citrus crops. While citrus can thrive in the foothills, but not everywhere, in many locations, a shallow top soil covers an impenetrable granite formation. In other locations, the added irrigation canals created marshlands. Whitney's dreamed Placer County citrus colony began to fade. Many of his English settlers began to flee home. Rockland was located at the foot of the Sierra Nevada mountains. It was an ideal spot for Central Pacific Railroad to locate a roundhouse. The roundhouse provided pusher engines for the arduous climb up the Sierra Nevada mountains to Truckee. But in need of a larger rail yard, in 1908, the railroad left Rockland for Roseville. Up to 100 businesses and residential buildings were uplifted and moved to Roseville. In 1906, a catastrophic earthquake struck San Francisco. San Francisco was in desperate need for building materials. This brought a brief revival to Rockland's granite industry. The stonecutters went out on strike in 1921 and again the following year. Technology had shifted. Less expensive concrete replaced granite. One by one, the quarries closed. By 1928, of the 50-some quarries, only seven remained in operation. In 2002, Big Gun, also known as Capital Quarry, was the last to close. J.P. Whitney passed away January 17, 1913, in Monterey, California. He was 78 years old. He was buried close to his beloved Spring Valley home. Today, the Whitney family mausoleum can be found adjacent to the 11th and 12th green on the Whitney Oaks golf course. 
After J.P. Whitney's youngest daughter passed away in 1935, the mansion fell into disrepair. His heirs began selling off large parcels of the vast estate. To avoid paying property taxes, the new owners, the Horseshoe Cattle Company, demolished the family home in the early 1950s. Today, only a marker remains. In 1914, boys playing with matches started a conflagration in which the Rockland Volunteer Fire Department could not stop. Except for the few buildings made of granite, almost all of downtown Rockland was destroyed. With the quarries closed and the railroad moved to Roseville, Rockland's once prosperous downtown would never be rebuilt. In the 1880s, Japanese immigrants began their pilgrimage to America. Many made their first stop in Hawaii before moving to the mainland. A vibrant Japanese community developed in the towns of Penryn, Loomis, Newcastle, and Auburn. Not only working in the local fruit orchards, Japanese residents opened markets, dry goods stores, boarding houses, two bars, a dentist's office, pool hall, and a garage. The Hawaiian sugar plantations were desperate for workers. In 1907, they placed an advertisement in a Spanish newspaper offering free passage to Hawaii and guaranteed employment. 2,246 Spaniards, including whole families, boarded the SS Heliopolis for the voyage. 50 plus days at sea. In the Straits of Magellan, there would only be one stop, Punto Arenas, Chile. Those who made the arduous journey, men's wages would be set at $20 per month, young men's wages $15 per month, and a woman's wage just $12 per month. In addition, workers would receive free rent, free medical care, free schooling for their children, and after three years, the house and one acre of land would be theirs free and clear. Over a six-year period, 9,262 Spaniards will have made the arduous journey to Hawaii. The planters had high hopes that the Spaniards would become a permanent workforce. However, within two years of arriving, almost all of the immigrants would once again board ships for a new life in California. For some, the long journey would end here in Rockland, California. Local residents referred to the new community as Spanish Town. The Spaniards would join Finnish stoneworkers. Their homes can still be seen just off Rockland Road near the Rockland Historical Museum. Eight hundred fifty miles off the coast of Portugal are the Azores, nine volcanic islands, drought, poor soil, and too many mouths to feed. While some herded sheep and goats, many earned their living at sea. They were explorers, fishermen, and whalers. In the 1880s, the Portuguese government did not want their youth of military age to emigrate. Escape, however, was easy. One need only look for a waiting whaling ship off the coast. They were always eager for an extra hand. Or maybe a passenger ship. Transit to Boston steerage class was only 10 to $15. Some Azorians headed for Hawaii or even the east coast of the United States. But to most, California beckoned. There was gold in the Sierra Nevada foothills fishing and whaling in Monterey, and farming in both the San Joaquin Valley and the Sierra Nevada foothills. In 1919, the population of the Azores was about 300,000. At the same time, the United States Census figures showed that there were 100,000 Azorians residing in the United States. In the late 18th century, Cammie Vargas Morales' family immigrated from the Azores to Boston. 
In Boston, the men earned their living fishing. Tragically, Cammie's great-grandfather was lost at sea. The tragedy left her great-grandmother a widow with six children. Cammie tells what happened next. The uh, youngest daughter was my grandmother, who is Rose Carey, and uh, she actually had tuberculosis. And so her mother brought her and the six children out to California because she thought the weather would be better for her uh, and the tuberculosis. So they came to Lincoln and um, on my grandfather's side, he, um, his name was Antonio Vargas and um, the daughter that had tuberculosis um, actually married my grandfather's brother, who was Manuel Vargas. And they came here in 1908, I believe, from the Azores. And uh, they worked at, um, Manuel actually um, died in the flu epidemic. And so she remarried um, Manuel's brother, who is my grandfather, Antonio. And um, they had uh, two children and they, Antonio purchased the 20 acres that, that is part of our ranch here and they built a house down um, along the creek and um, had my father and then my grandmother, um, Rose Carey, actually uh, from the tuberculosis was put in an institution. She had tuberculosis, but um, my grandfather, um, came here and he was a teamster when he came here and then he also worked at Gladdy McBean um, in Lincoln and that's a clay plant um, that a lot of people around here worked at and uh, he also had a fruit orchard um, he, the land he purchased was cherry trees so they had um, a lot of cherry trees and they um, harvested the fruit and um, then um, my father ended up marrying my mother and um, they started purchasing more and more land and they had turkeys uh, at one point and then they had a dairy and um, in the 70s they switched from dairy cows to beef cattle. And the Vargas farm would grow from both leased land and further purchases reaching 1,000 acres. Over the next 70 years, the success and failure of the Vargas Ranch would parallel the success and failure of other farms. Once again, our story begins in the gold rush. With the discovery of gold, California's population exploded. Imported food was expensive. To supply the needs of the new residents, farming became a major industry. The first Welch gold miners had planted a wide variety of fruit trees. J.P. Whitney developed vineyards as well as his famous citrus colony. In the first decade of the 20th century, the dead and dying citrus trees had to be replaced. Soon, spring brought forth a profusion of colors from plums, peaches, pears, and nut trees. 1906. A joint venture between Union Pacific and Southern Pacific Railroads would help transform the Sierra Nevada foothills into the fruit basket of America. Pacific Fruit Express, or PFE, made it possible for fresh California fruit to be delivered to the East Coast. At the Roseville Rail Yard, the largest ice house on the West Coast was constructed. Newcastle became a boomtown, both as a shipping point for its bountiful crops and as a summer tourist destination. In 1923, Central Pacific Railroad shipped 2,547 rail cars of fruit. Events, both near and far, would once again have a negative influence on the economy of Placer County foothills. In 1908, a pear blight began to spread across California's orchards. The only remedy was to pull out the trees and burn them. 1929, the worst economic depression in United States history struck the United States. Demand for fruit and vegetables fell. 1940, the Department of Agriculture Farm Security Administration helped relocate 
Oklahoma Dust Bowl farmers to Placer County foothills to start a new life. December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor. California's valuable export crops would now be curtailed for the duration of World War II. The war would have a tragic effect on Placer County's Japanese community. Japanese residents had stoically endured years of bigotry both informally and through restrictive state and federal laws. Now they face their ultimate challenge. 1942, President Roosevelt's Executive Order 9066 ordered all residents of Japanese ancestry, whether a legal resident or a natural born citizen, all must report to a collection site and be relocated away from the California coast. Fred Korematsu, a citizen by birth, appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The court ordered Mr. Korematsu to abide by the president's orders. Fungus infections, economic depression, World War II, each brought its own calamity. The foothill farmers began to downsize. Leases were not renewed. Orchards were abandoned, replaced with pastures. In March 1943, the War Department purchased a large tract of land just off of Highway 49 and Bell Road. In just five months, in August 1943, DeWitt General Military Hospital opened. By August 30th, 1945, the hospital was serving 2,310 patients. But in just two years, 1947, the hospital was deemed surplus. Today, the hospital area serves Placer County's government offices. After the war, some, like the Nita family, were able to return to their devastated Loomis family farm and once again begin the Herculean task of rebuilding. But for most of the Japanese community, they would never return. After World War II, the Army Corps of Engineers the United States Bureau of Reclamation and the state of California began massive water projects. The goal was to transfer water from Northern California to the drier regions of California. The recipients, the San Joaquin Valley and Southern California. Land that was once arid and inexpensive, unsuitable for farming, now with subsidized inexpensive water was transformed into large corporate farms. Today, Bolt House Farms, for example, farms 60,000 acres. The small family operated farms of the Sierra Nevada, by economy of scale, would find it very difficult to compete against the corporate farms. A new business model would be needed to survive. A more intimate approach, produce and fruit direct from your local farm to your kitchen or restaurant. Salmon habitat? Real or an expensive joke? Or these? Do these drains really flow to a stream? And if so, does it really matter? Each fall, Chinook salmon do return to their birth streams. Their odyssey began when their eggs hatched in our local creeks. For one to two years, they matured in fresh water before following the currents downstream entering San Francisco Bay and finally exiting through the Golden Gate. They remained at sea for two to five years. Chinook salmon are the largest of the salmon family, noted for their ability to travel long distances both at sea and when they return to spawn. Only one or two percent of those who began the journey will survive and return to spawn. For the adult returning Chinook salmon, there will be no return. Each fall, the Dry Creek Conservancy conducts a survey in which volunteers walk Roseville and Rockland streams, counting the number of Chinook salmon who have returned to spawn. The survey is a one-day event and lasts just three hours. In 2003, the salmon count recorded 680 live salmon. 
If we average the sightings for the years 2010, 2011, and 2012, the three-hour fish count should record an average of 129 Chinook salmon. Last year, 2014, during California's severe drought, the count fell to only 53 recorded sightings. As water moves downstream, each storm water discharge contributes more and more contamination. Contamination builds. Creeks empty into streams, streams empty into rivers, rivers into bays, bays flow into the oceans. We play in contaminated water. We consume the fish of our rivers and oceans. We're here in Rockland at an abandoned stretch of highway. It was built 100 years ago. When it was constructed, it revolutionized transportation in the Sierra Nevada foothills. The highway began in San Francisco and went through Placer County all the way to Atlantic City, New Jersey. The highway was designated US 40. US 40 did gain a reputation amongst motorists, especially through Rockland. In order to handle the influx of Olympic visitors, the 1960 Squaw Valley Winter Games required a new modern freeway. I-80 Interstate was born, and with the completion of the new freeway, the aged US-40 was retired. The construction of I-80 brought an unintended consequence. The I-80 would open a floodgate of urban sprawl. We can still use US-40 as our conduit to rediscover our past. So hop in and let's explore. Our tour begins in Rockland, just off US 40, at Johnson Spring View Park. The land was once a dairy ranch owned by the Huff family. Now it is a sprawling city park with a unique not to miss site. Park at the corner of 5th Street and Rockland Road. Follow the short gravel trail behind the historic Huff Johnson home. There you will find the Huff Mineral Springs, as well as one of the largest Maidu bedrock mortar sites in the region. For our next stop on Rockland Road, head back towards US 40. Making a right turn on Front Street, we will visit Rockland's oldest public building, St. Mary's of the Assumption, built in 1883 and served the Catholic community until 1983. The Rockland Historical Society saved the structure, restoring it and moving the church to its present location. Across from St. Mary's Church is the Barundani Building. It was built in 1905. Across from St. Mary's on Rockland Road is a new city park commemorating Rockland's famous roundhouse. The roundhouse provided pusher engines, making the Transcontinental Railroad ascent over the Sierra Nevada possible. Just across the street from the city offices is the Rockland History Museum. They can advise you on other places to visit. In addition, be sure to view their informative website. Back on historic US 40, we have a few more stops to make. In Loomis, we will visit High Hand Nursery. It is a must-see stop. Be sure to enter the cavernous historic packing shed. We continue east on US 40. 
In Penryn, stop and visit Griffith Quarry Park and Museum. The quarry's office is open on weekends. After your visit, heading north, go left on English Colony Road. On your right is the original Griffith family home, and on your left is a granite structure built by Mr. Griffith. Our destination is Trailer Ranch. The ranch was once part of Whitney's citrus colony, but the land was unsuitable for citrus. The Trailer family used the land as a cattle ranch and eventually donated the land to Placer County. Today, Trailer Ranch is a bird sanctuary and is administered by the Horseman Association and Audubon Society. Our last tour will take us to Hidden Falls Regional Park. Follow US 40 up to the old PG&E powerhouse. Make a left turn onto Weiss Road. Follow Weiss Road. In a few miles, you will make a right turn onto Mount Vernon Road. Then follow the signs to Hidden Falls Regional Park. A beautiful way to end the day here in Placer County would be visiting Hidden Falls Placer County Regional Park. Bring a picnic basket and come up and share the beautiful, wonderful countryside. So we're from Sacramento and this is our first time being in this beautiful country and I mean this is active, this is so phenomenal and it really should be preserved. This video was produced by the Dry Creek Conservancy. The goal of the Conservancy is to facilitate watershed conservation, restoration and education within the American River Basin. Videos on the American River Basin can be found on YouTube slash user slash Michael Stark One, YouTube slash user slash Roseville TV, or the Dry Creek Conservancy.org.